Thank you all for coming. Uh, as you can see, I am not Ava Raspini, so you're going to have to bear with me. I'm sure a lot of you came to hear her in conversation with these fabulous two artists who she has um, worked with for the platform section. We're really honored to have you both here, so thank you. Um, I will be reading a little bit because I'm not nearly as uh, well-versed about Ava's section as she is. Um, so I'm just going to give you a bit of background on platform section, and then we'll let the artists uh, share a bit about their work, and then we'll, we're going to be in a little bit of conversation about their work and I have Ava's questions so she was very well prepared for this um, so thank you are we living at the hinge of history as has been theorized the last few years have been a period of enormous instability and uncertainty how do artists help us navigate this moment reframe the past through the present and account for history's omissions and erasures Platform 2023 brings together large-scale sculptures, installations, and site-specific works by artists who offer shifting and multiple perspectives where history has often provided a single perspective. The Agora is the central artery of the Armory Show. The name recalls the ancient Greek practice of assembling in public. Encompassing a poly polyphony of, of approaches to installation and sculpture, the works assembled in the Agora are propositions for our time. Under the loose theme of rewriting histories, this presentation features artists expanding or challenging the historical canon, which is often preoccupied by inclusion and exclusion. The artists in Platform 2023 use history as material, imagine speculative futures, and employ a variety of material traditions as a means of history telling. Topics include the complex histories tied to colonialism, land and power, the legacy of labor and migration movements in the 20th century, the combining of disparate accounts to underscore history's subjectivity, and how materials carry their own cultural values and meanings. Although the materials and approaches vary, collectively, the artists in Platform 2023 are invested in world building. Hank Willis Thomas reframes images that circulate widely in the world. Strike, which is on view here, is based on the 1934 lithograph strike scene by Ukrainian-American painter and printmaker Louis Lozowick, which depicts a charged confrontation between a work, worker and authority. Thomas has isolated a single element from the print, one hand stopping another swing of a baton, transforming this disembodied gesture into a large-scale bronze. Through cropping and reframing, strike prompts questions about the enactment of justice. Is justice the arm swinging the baton or the force stopping it? Shazia Sikander's multivalent bronze sculpture offers an abstracted and amorphous notion of the female body that refuses to be fixed, grounded, or stereotyped. The figure emerges out of a lotus plant, ubiquitous in many cultures as a symbol of humility, awakening, and clarity. Originally created as part of a public art collaboration between Madison Square Park Conservancy and the Courthouse of the Appellate Division, First Department of the Supreme Court of the State of New York, now is the first female figure to adorn one of the ten plinths on the courthouse roof. Situated in a prominent position of power, the sculpture, whose title makes reference to the National Organization for Women, offers a reimagining of the feminine as an active agent, thinker, and participant, as well as a witness to the patriarchal history of art and law. So now we're going to hear a little bit from Shazia, who will move to the podium to share some of her images and, her, and talk about her practice, and then we'll hear from Hank, and then we'll have the discussion. Thank you. everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So um, thank you for that um, introduction and uh, super happy to be here and being able to have this opportunity to share a little bit more about the work and the process behind uh, my practice. So as a thinker, as an artist, I am always thinking like art is about knowledge construction. 
and that how can I anchor that in my in my making so thinking about history I'm always concerned that how we reckon with our otherness in a shifting world how we proximate reproduce and reenact our culture our histories whatever we make consume and give back it has resonance and consequence beyond our immediate lives so how we experience art how we respond to it and how we interpret it is such an open ended premise so i have as an artist I have to believe that the function of art is to allow multiple meanings and possibilities and in that it will open up space for a more just world more just representations so um recently i had the opportunity to create an outdoor public artwork in madison square park and for that i started to um reflect on my own practice which has primarily been as a painter as a, a 2d artist so i was thinking the first thing was like how do i take that idea uh, uh, of a um person that engages with a material in a very different way and how can i anchor my shift by thinking about drawing as something which has um velocity and uh, movement and uh, malleability so often um thinking about drawing in um shifting ways and pushing the idea and the concept of drawing allows me a lot of possibilities even when i'm working with the composer i'm thinking of drawing as a libretto so that sort of was the point of departure but the sculpture itself is part of a larger multimedia project titled hava to breathe air life and which includes um the sculpture that you see here which is currently also on the roof of the appellate division courthouse and it had a a sister sculpture which was in the park in the Madison Square Park and there was also an AR lens called Apparition that I had created in partnership with Snapchat where I wanted to bring the idea of the sculpture um to people because you you see it on the roof so you can't really visit it so I thought how could I bring that experience where people could actually engage with it and walk around it and look at it in different ways so that that's how the ar lens came about so on the roof of the courthouse you know of course there are these male statues of ancient lawgivers and they represent the in since it was created in 1800 and um uh in like 1900 so at that time it's a very different representation of the world view so there's a chinese law hebraic law persian law anglo-saxon law spartan law um the, the there was a removal of a sculpture and which had opened up the space so i remember like standing on the street looking up at the courthouse and thinking about how these figurative sculptures of the famous male philosophers and lawgivers all looked very much alike and in a state of despair and eerily similar so i at that time i was like oh this vacancy for is uh, on the on the east side of the building screamed for a female representation so that's literally how the kind of idea came about because we're always walking around in new york city so there's so much information and everything's so saturated uh so you're not necessarily are thinking that there's going to be an open spot in which you can propose a sculpture but often times when you're walking and you're looking up you know it can lead to great ideas so it was a wonderful opportunity to reach out to the courthouse through the Madison Square Park and figure out a way in which part of the project could exist up there so the piece itself is an 8 foot uh, bronze uh, painted a uh, work with the lotus which has of course a plethora of meanings and um i was also thinking about the invisible roots of the lotus that lie below the depth of the water which are also echoed in the feminine figure itself so in you know of course in terms of its meaning aside i'm also thinking the form so the petal within petal formation 
which also refers to the microcosm and the macrocosm. So that arabesque nature of the, of the piece is also uh, quite significant. I didn't want to borrow an existing plinth um, that belonged to the male representation, so I was like, it'll be cool if it comes with its own um, plinth or platform. So um, the, this sort of concept of a shape-shifting, expanding iconography has been really, has been prominent in my work since the 90s. You can see, like, I have created these sort of um, repre feminine representations primarily in paintings. So I was also uh, looking back at that practice to really imagine how I could pull things apart and pull them out, like what would it, how could I imagine a very detailed drawing which is not bigger than a notebook page into a form which, which obviously is at much larger scale but also has to be accounted for in its engagement, you know, with its own space and time and context. So these, 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 these things are echoed also in the other work where I, at that time, I thought, started thinking about the metal, about the, the body of the figure. So again, looking at the paintings, there is um, a, 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 this expanding um, a, a skirt which allows all the feminine baggage to be absorbed and be kind of expand and it keeps moving and growing. So I thought, okay, if I could think of, the, of this idea of the skirt that's in my practice for 30 years and how could I equate that to the, to the elements, architectural elements in the courthouse. So I looked at the Maitland Armstrong stained glass ceiling dome of the Appalachian Courthouse room, its translucency, its defined architectural properties, reimagining this sort of massive dome as a house, a space, demarcating a site of renewal. And this inverted dome then transformed itself into this uh, armature that hoists the body. So I wanted witness to be buoyant, hovering in space, her feet not touching the grass, afloat with the air surrounding her and keeping her in control. And so that's uh, uh, around the armature is also text which says breath, but also translates uh, in Urdu into Eve. And that is all uh, created in, in, in mosaic. So that was another way, it was like I was making these mosaics and one of them is here also um, at the Sean Kelly booth. And, I was thinking, how can I bring the practice of mosaics into the direction of sculpture as well? So that's, that, that's another way. But all of it was really is anchored in drawing. And so the symbols and images that exist have really been, um, like I think of them as a duende that's present in my work. It comes about in various syncretic sort of, uh, through looking at very syn various syncretic sculptural traditions as well. But um, femininity, you know, to me, is this tension between women and power, how society perceives such a dynamic and how erasure is often enacted by the so social forces that shape women's lives. So here also, if you look at it, you can see the braided hair is not a reference to Medusa, but is coming from the syncretic visual histories of mass from Africa and Asia. The image is also a cult from an older painting of mine which was created soon after 9-11, which was basically my way of creating an image that would be a, um, a resistance to the patronizing war rhetoric of saving, quote-unquote, Muslim women. And um, so I kind of started there looking for elements into, in from my own sort of paint, painting practice and then developing the piece. Um, you can also see there is a reference to the... Um, decorative javits at the ne neckline, which are, uh, were an accessory popularized by the U.S. Supreme Court's Associate Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And it's also, for me, the feminization of the black judicial robes, which were traditionally worn by male justices. So all these elements come along, but again, um, it's 
coming from the larger ethos of the feminine, like throughout literature, the notion of the female has been in conversation with the visible-invisible divide, the feminine as the monstrous, the abject, the fecund, the immense, the vulnerable, and how does intimacy, selfhood, valor, resistance, and you know, again, femininity's intersections with race and war, how are they, uh, how do they come about in an artwork? And oftentimes for me, it's like, how can they, these be markers that expose the fear that lurks when boundaries melt? So that's always been the key sort of interest in my practice is that how can I play with the feminine without it being literally about the female, but you know, how to develop a lexicon. And the lexicon is often, I think of it as a space that can be visited and revisited for collaboration. But it, it really comes out of looking um, at a lot of women writers whether it's Bell Hooks, Adrian Rich, Fahmida Riaz, Salman, Sol, Salman Sharif, like for me, the radical thinkers and feminist thinkers like Angela Carter, Audre Lorde, Rebecca Solnit, Sim, Simborska, Rankin, Claudia Rankin, Parveen Shakir, like these have been over a long period of time spaces that I have wanted to um, create um, philosophical links, but also looking at how poets can um, capture a moment in society and time that crystallizes a moment and that can be timeless. So that too is like how to equate my practice with that of a poet. Um, I wanted to just check what the time was and uh, just to make sure that... Okay. So... Um, Sure. Uh, so I, um, you know, erotics, landscape, practices of concealment, staging, erasure, thinking about detail, these all are elements that I have really explored by looking at the pre-modern and uh, historical manuscripts of primarily South Asia and uh, also Central Asia. So I'm really thinking when I'm looking at these objects at their own histories as well, how they have been subjected to a very long colonial history where they have been um, often removed and plundered and dispersed and so much of this material resides in Western institutions' storages. And what does that mean in terms of its uh, availability or accessibility? Like whose culture are we all engaging with? And oftentimes there is such a focus on where you're from or which country you're representing. So I'm really interested in how to kind of think about these representations of of nation and diaspora in, in, and kind of offer new ways of um, reimagining even those spaces and the archetypal characters. And uh, it, the ways in which I have gone about is by, you know, looking, creating drawings and like creating animations and disrupting iconographies like here the feminine form disappears and leaves a trace behind which is basically the hair and as the ha hair moves around it gives me the potential to think of it as a particle system so when I'm choreographing movements it can create multiple associations whether it then becomes a participant in the film or it can also be projected um, you know outside of the space of the institution so when I think of the pixel, I'm also thinking of the unit of the mosaic, and that's the work touchstone, which is also in the, in, 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 here. And the idea of how um, uh, the pixel and mosaic allow me to think about um, mosaic through, through, through the direction of movement. So it's not just about capturing an image in, an, in another medium, but how to disrupt its internal organizing principles. And um, 
which basically comes back to the question of why shift from painting into the realm of the sculptural. And I think for me, some of the questions that I want to pose is, where does the power lie in an image? How is time visualized in an artwork? Does art create new ways to experience time? And how can a painting erode its historically produced reality, its value-giving, mediated structures? And what role does repatriation of objects with suspect provenance play in the accountability of museums? Can it determine how and what we see, how our beliefs tied to reproduction of cultural knowledge? So I think I'm Thank you. Here. Thank you so much, Shazia. All right, Hank, you're up. <laughs> no pressure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that wonderful, enlightening presentation. I was hoping you were going to start to answer some of those questions uh, verbally, as well as you do in your work. Um, I'm also, one of the things that uh, we're suffering from is the light, uh, because we can't really see your faces. And um, whenever I don't get opportunities to talk as often, well, I do, and I don't st stop when I do. <laughs> um, but um, it's really important to me uh, that I acknowledge that my work is um, infinite, uh, and that is in every waking moment. And I, I've been coming to terms with the truth that I want to be immortal. And I, I think that is actually what most artists, and maybe most people, would say if they were being honest, that, that what we make is an attempt to live forever. And then when I took it further, I realized that probably every interaction that I have that is remembered is part of my uh, immortality. And as we were here together, making this moment together, I realized that we are um, actually collaborating uh, creatively and um, that we are multiplying within each other. What we learned during the pandemic is that we're all connected, that even sitting as far away as you are, we're breathing a part of me might, is going into you and back. Um, and so we're here together. And I really wanted to take a moment to... Um, invite everyone to look around and acknowledge the people that they're making this life with that will be carried forward uh, in front of you, behind you. How about some waving, <laughs> some verbal acknowledgement. Thank you for coming. Good to see you. Uh, it's so, I'm so grateful to share air with you. Um, this is something that I didn't even think was possible not too long ago. Um, and so what I am working towards in my own process of awakening um, in my work is this kind of perpetual awareness, which I fail at so often. I fall asleep every second in that way. Uh, but, and, uh, but in my practice, when I feel like I'm doing my best, I am putting messages into the world in public space, in a private space, um, that have, uh, that inspire people to um, remember who they are. The thing that's also amazing about most people on the planet, sadly not everyone, is that almost all of us were made out of love, like literally. Like, it's pretty incredible to think that everybody who's ever lived on some level was made out of love. Um, and we so easily focus on the things that divide us, the things we don't like about ourselves, that don't like about each other, things that we don't like about our society. I, I wonder what, what happens when we start to really remember why we're all here. Uh, and my cousin, Sunga Willis, who was murdered um, over 20 years ago, um, had this mantra that I've been using in my work for a long time, which is love over rules. And uh, it's my motto. And I'm happy to, be put to have been able to install this um, in downtown San Francisco in 2017. But throughout my practice in making public-ish work, which 
started at Socrates Sculpture Park uh, with Kambuyo Olajimi, who's right there, who has work also here in the fair in booth 406. Um, um, but I also think about like the the the, the kind of the, the fleeting, the, the, like the the, the 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 hopes and the dreams that we have, and also um, the truth, which is also this form of um, it's a battleground, right? My truth, even though Barbara, there's a seat for you right there. Um, come, oh, someone took it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's another one over there. Um, the, the truth is something that we all feel like we, have, we own. I have the right to the truth. I know the truth. You don't know the truth. But the truth is that your truth and my truth are both true, and they may be in contrast to one another. And so one of the collaborative projects I've done uh, with the collective that is called Cause Collective is called The Truth Booth. It's a modern-day confession booth, place to claim our, 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 our own reality. Um, and we've traveled it uh, to South Africa, to uh, uh, 35 states, to Afghanistan, to Ireland, uh, to Mexico and Australia. And it's really been enlightening for me and the viewers, the participants, to actually really actually witness someone sh sharing vulnerability um, with something that we are not often trained uh, to do in our society. So it's something that we don't really feel like we can do or that we need to have some preparation for. And so the Truth Booth, in my opinion, is really a generosity project. It's a project where it gives people a platform to be experts, um, but also gives uh, viewers an opportunity to actually learn something from someone who they didn't even ne necessarily know they, they had something to gain from. And um, so in, in a lot of my early public work, this, but this is, it started in 2008 or whatever, but this is an extension of that project in 2015 with Public Art Fund in Metro Tech. Um, and we had these, uh, we had the truth booth there for some period, and we had these um, signs that uh, would read things like, the truth is I hear you, the truth is I feel you, the truth is I respect you. And the other side of it, it would, uh, say that in the 24 most spoken languages in, in the city, and then there would be placards which could teach you how to say things phonetically. Um, and so I've really been interested in what intimacy looks like in public space. Uh, the truth is I love you, just like words that um, seem to be directed specifically towards you, because most of the words we see in public space are telling us where to go, what to buy, and how to behave. And I feel like it's important to um, put wonder and play in, in objects and images in public space. So we also made these speech bubble benches, which people who sit in become statements. Um, I was able to show them there in other places in the country. Um, this is outside of Rockefeller Center. Um, and so I think I, I've really been kind of fascinated with the power of a statement. In this case, uh, Make America Great Again, which is uh, been coined or co-opted, more co-opted by a specific president, even though at least the last five previous presidents were uh, recorded making the statement, all likely having a very different intention. Uh, but I, I, what I was fascinated by in the 2016 campaign, uh, when this was a kind of call to action or a call to fight, a call to, uh, to, to, against, to, to, to work against or work for, that is still somewhat relevant, or some might say very relevant, um, is the question that never really came up or was never really discussed, when was, quote, unquote, America better than it is today, um, where we have more empowered, uh, more enlightened, more aware, more opportunity, more engaged um, people than we ever have. And some might argue that uh, during the civil rights movement of the 1960s where uh, disenfranchised young and, uh, and sometimes less well, poor and uh, sometimes less educated people um, stood up nonviolently with dignity, love, and grace to the powers that be um, and showed the best through their nonviolent creative civic action of what America could be.
And so we made this billboard with a collaborative called Four Freedoms that I'm a part of, um, where we did hundreds of billboards across the country, um, kind of speaking to the role of critical discourse and the political discourse using fine art thinking. This is another billboard, um, All Lives Matter, uh, because some people were saying uh, Black Lives Matter, so other people were saying All Lives Matter. But the truth of the All Lives Matter story to many of us is that some, in between the lines, is that all lives matter, but some more than others. And so wanting to kind of complicate these stories, but also acknowledging um, that the people who hurt us um, are us, <laughs> or more like us than we think. Uh, this is a billboard by an artist named Paula Crown. And uh, this phrase, which we all know, hurt people, hurt people, is something that I come back to a lot and think this was a really important message to be putting up in public space. Or this one by Christine Sun Kim, um, who's one of my favorite artists, where words shape reality. And the ability to put what we see in these art fairs, because not everyone gets to come to the Armory Show, you know? So we get to bring the Armory Show to the world through uh, Four Freedoms and, um, and through artists that we love. And I was inspired in part uh, throughout my work, many things, but um, through the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, uh, Brian Stevenson's uh, incredible um, creative civic action, someone who is not seen as an artist, as a trained lawyer, claiming public space for a creative reinterpretation or re-acknowledgement of public space in the, in the, in the American story. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be um, able to include a sculpture in that, that space. And, and I really started to really come to the awareness of something I always knew, but to come to really acknowledge that what we put out in the public matters. It tells, it, it, it's where most of us learn about who we are, who our society is, what's important, what's not important, who's important, who's not important. And the more of us who are putting things in public space that I hope have a spirit of, of curiosity and generosity and creativity, uh, the more, um, I think, diverse and complicated and hopefully um, um, evolved our society can be. And so my messages in my work like unity and liberty and duality and strike um, are really asking myself and viewers to think about who they are in this Rorschach test of are you, is, it, is justice the, the person holding the baton or the person stopping the person holding the baton. Um, or uh, this work with Kobe Kennedy Reach where it's about kind of this moment that we also didn't have for long where we could touch someone else without concern. Um, and then most uh, recently on a large scale, um, this monument to love called The Embrace, uh, which is uh, a, a monument uh, uh, to Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King's um, love and their ability, not only their love for one another, but their love for society and the role of love in creating a world where we can all feel um, valued. And so my work comes back to that all the time. And as I say, I want to be remembered so I can live forever. Um, and uh, an upcoming project at Davidson College is With These Hands, which is acknowledging people who were under-acknowledged, who built the school, uh, who were slaves, who were uh, exploited people um, throughout the history of this college that um, created presidents and um, superstars. Um, and um, wanting to kind of pay homage to that through this sculpture. And so um, my work continues. Thank you. Amazing. I think that um, we need more people like Shazi and Hank in the world, first of all. Um, Amazing, amazing presentations. Thank you for sharing a little bit about your practice with us. I'm going to now turn to uh, Ava's questions. Um, so I'll start, you talk, her, her first question was about starting as painter or, or um, you know, working through photography for Hank, um, but you kind of touched on moving to sculpture. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything else about the move to sculpture, Shazi, you touched on it, how you envision sculpture, you know, moving, making that move from painting to sculpture, or Hank, using photography, and, and really then um, also doing sculpture. If you want to talk about 
what that shift is or why it occurred? Um, yeah, I think one point that I just thought of is uh, I had a show at the Morgan Library just uh, two, two years ago or 21, and a lot of the work was work that I had created more than two decades ago. So it was works from early 90s, mid 90s. And I saw that work myself for the first time in those years. So my first thought was that so much of this work, all of it is drawing. So it goes right back into storages and nobody gets to see it. And though it may have been collected by some American institutions, I had never ever seen that work in any institution. So it was like, how do you bypass that? <laughs> so I was thinking institutional regulations, restrictions, the sort of where drawing sits. And I was like, how can I take that ethos of that practice, the, that, the, the theme that runs through that work, the feminine, and maybe there's a way I can make that into a medium which I don't have, which won't be subjected to that. So that was just me thinking as an artist, looking at, at that practice. So that's perhaps one way. But I, I don't really think that um, I have to move to sculpture. Like I'm, I'm just moving, you know. And it's idea driven. So whatever um, medium best engages that, but I think as an artist, I'm, I am a research-based artist, so I enjoy uh, that I have to push myself and, you know, so of course when the project with Madison Square Park came about, I, I had to create a work that would exist in public space and outdoors, so it right. had to be sculpture. But you feel it's, orga it's an organic process. Yeah. And Hank? Uh, well, I come from a photographic background. I studied photography. Um, my mother is a photogra photographer and a photo historian, Deborah Willis. And um, so research has been central to my work forever. Um, and I even think about sculpture from a photographic perspective. So um, one of the things that's been exciting with relatively recent technology is 3D scanning and 3D printing. So that sculpture was actually made it's, it's really a photograph. <laughs> um, be, and I, th I really am kind of excited about, when I would look at historical images, I was always like, what would it be like to be there? And so for me, uh, the work that I have here, but also in Ben Brown's booth, um, is uh, about um, the wonder of a photographic moment and how to kind of come back to it. Um, and so um, I'm always still kind of going through the world as a photographer who's discovering and wandering and exploring and inspiring, hopefully inspiring other people to do the same. That's, that's amazing. Thank you both. Um, you also both think about erasure, but in very different ways. Uh, Hank, in your early photographic works, you literally remove elements of photographs that circulate in the public realm to reveal something about our culture. And Shazia, you talk about the erasure of women in the civic space or from the realm of art. Can you each talk more about this idea of erasure as a me methodology? So um, when, when I'm thinking erasure, I'm also thinking about, you know, how is history constructed? So if history is really an account of storytelling and it's a, it's a movement of objects and ideas and bodies and it's complex, so whoever gets to tell the story is often the highest bidder, and that is how we create history. So for me, that's one way that there's gonna be, history is not clear accounts, or it's gonna be competing accounts. So there's, inevitably, there is erasure conceptually in the notion of history, but then also I'm thinking mystery. So for me, mystery is, is the creative space, whether how do you reorganize historical accounts, how do you go into the archives, how do you imagine stories that happened but nobody was there to tell them. So when I think of erasure, I'm also thinking of a space that can be a creatively fecund for me, where I can 
introduce stories that, you know, that are connected to their time and space that are happening now, but they have, they, they happen at another time too. And often women's stories are missing. And uh, we live in a very hyper-masculinized uh, culture in general. So, you know, but I'm not thinking in a binary. I'm really thinking how to think of the in-between space. And the in-between space is often can be a parallel to erasure. Hank, do you want to speak to that? Erasure in your work? <laughs> no? <laughs> I, I always think silence is a good example. <laughs> it's really, a, uh, um, it's so potent, you know, uh, and uh, they say that music is not made by the sounds but the silence. And so when I think about erasure, I, and in my own work, I'm thinking about... Uh, um, what can be um, highlighted through the removal of certain information, certain aspects of an image uh, so that we can hear or see it more clearly. Okay. How do you both see your role as an artist in the debates around monuments? And, and actually, I, Shazia, you've said, I like to think of my practice as an anti-monument because it engages the past without glorifying it. Or at least Ava told me that, that, that you said that. Um, can, you, can you talk more about that? Sure. Um, I, think, uh, I think all of us agree that the monument, there's no one monument can represent a culture, a society, a moment in time, history, a story, a race, an idea. So first of all, that's problematic as it is, this idea of one individual or one artwork or, um, one, or a monument. But it, that's how I was imagining kind of how to place a work in... In, in, in a public space and thinking that how could I um, create a form that can be where it's not situating itself in one representation. So that, that's, that was one way of thinking. But in terms of like the um, anti-monument idea, I think for me that's key to how I think about the practice of an artist that it is often going to be imaginative and imagination is gives, so it's about abundance, which is a counter to extractive ideas or extractiveness, which is how I think of like um, issues around colonial imperial histories, the extractive nature of capital, climate erosion, things that take versus things that give. So that's one way of thinking about the anti-monument. So, and also because I involve, like I look at archives, I look at history, so as a painter, the language around my work would never be seen as an anti-monument. So I was like, oh, what if I convert the drawing into a sculpture, will the rhetoric around that change? So that's where that quote comes from. Okay, Hank? Um, well, which debate about monuments is the question because um, everything that is put into public space that has some level of status or, or stature should be critiqued and debated and questioned not only for its relevance or its importance at the time it's put up but also throughout time. And um, I think it's all propaganda, right? You know, like we, we make big things that say who we are so that people know, you know, the Statue of Liberty, you know. Um, this is like, a, a, it's just propaganda. And I must acknowledge that I'm part of the propaganda machine. I hope I am a ghost in the machine. And I recognize that because the timeline of my work is longer than the timeline of my, time, of my breathing time frame on the planet, it, that it will change. You know, the embrace, which is pretty crazy to think that 60 million people go to Boston Common every year. So 
um, no, six million. So in 10 years, 60 million people will go. In 100 years, you know, presumably there'll be even more people or less, <laughs> but possibly a billion people have been, will have engaged with this work. And they're all going to have something different to say. Who gets to say something and who gets heard? I'm not really that interested in, in that, you know, because I, there's stuff I've hated that I came to like. There's stuff that I liked that I came to hate. And that's part of being a person. And so I just hope that whatever I make, that it, to the degree that um, I try really hard, that when you see things that I make in person, you feel implicated and hopefully uplifted. Yes, absolutely. Um, Thank you. Yeah. See, so you feel the love here. Yeah. <laughs> um, Shazia, when you installed at the courthouse overlooking Madison Square Park, the reversal of Roe v. Wade was front of mind and much of the dialogue around this work was centered on abortion rights. The installation from Madison Square Park will open in Houston in October. How do you think the work travels and how will it change for you in a new location? Well, I... <laughs> that is to be seen, right? Like, uh, even the sculpture here triggered so many people. <laughs> mm. It had uh, so many, like, you know, um, variety of responses, mm. and I, I enjoyed it. Like, I thought that is the beauty of putting work in public space, is the fact that it allows a kind of a democratization to happen where people who feel um, you know, there are many people that don't necessarily walk into a gallery and feel comfortable in right. terms of having, sharing an opinion on the work or within, very few people go to museums. So it's like, who, how do people respond? And what, and people do respond to art. Like people have opinions, they want to be heard and they want to share. And I, uh, I thought that was a really an interesting experience for me mm -hmm. to, um, to hear so much on social media, but in general, and, and how that could be understood when I was teaching with younger students and other artists, like how, how do you process all of that? And, you know, and not all artwork gets reactions. There, there's a lot of work that has been around and it's just sort of never really gets any elicits much. So what is that dynamic? Why is certain work um, able to create a more a dialogue, which I think is always important? Well, I think the public art certainly, you know, it invites that dialogue, which we, we both want. And also I'm wondering for you, when you're putting that artwork out there, it's a very vulnerable position yeah. because you're getting the feedback and some of it's positive and some of it might be a little bit more um, challenging. And do you feel more vulnerable presenting public work than just a show, like a, a painting or a photograph that's gonna go in a gallery show or is it all vulnerable? All of it is, uh, all of, it is of course, outside of your control when it exits your space. So I, I'm not that, I'm, I, I'm not thinking how, what's gonna happen. I have to take responsibility for the work in the way I'm making it. And that's the best I do. And I can learn from that as I grow. Yeah. And how about you? Do you feel vulnerable with all of it? Or is that even something that enters your head? I think, uh, you wanna come up? <laughs> Come on up. What's made me vulnerable oh, hi is there. my little buddy here. Come all oh, the way up. Oh, hi, sweetie. Come on up. <laughs> Come on. Uh, so when I make work that goes in the public space uh, that will likely be around after I'm not around, hopefully in 100 years, um, hopefully this person will still be around and her sister. And uh, whatever I do um, must honor her. And that's very scary. Yeah. Um, so things changed when you had kids. Yeah. Yeah. Especially wonderful, beautiful, <laughs> smart, intelligent, loving kids. Amazing. Uh, so, so that's definitely changed the way I see everything. It's like, yep. uh-oh. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm <laughs> Do I really? Because this is who I'm talking to. Like, I, I, when she starts to ask why, I have to have a good answer. Yeah. Wow. Well, welcome to the stage. What's your name? Zenzi. 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 So nice to meet you, and we're glad you could join us up here. Okay, I have a couple more questions. Um, how do you see the role of activism in your work? That's to both of you. <laughs> well, um, I think just being able to, well, it depends, right? When I think about the U.S., it's being Asian or Asian American <laughs> in the U.S. What does that mean? It's such a space of vis hyper visibility and invisibility and how do you represent that space when there are multiple um, ethnicities languages cultures countries that all are vying for representation so what this kind of um, hybrid or hyphenated identities of the u.s how do you respond to it how do you create more space there or how do you um, you know, open up those boxes of representation? So when I'm thinking about that, I'm really thinking that that is art is going to jostle for space there. And in that, we need more representations. So if with that in mind, the sculpture on the, the, its context on the roof of the courthouse had much more at stake than for it just to be in the armory, for example. Right. So, so there's possibility in artwork. Of course, it gets activated with context too. So as an artist, as somebody who really creates everything by thinking and drawing, I have to believe that, they, that the work will enter that discourse or dialogue. And what can I do to that practice that allows for it? So it, it, how it can open up representation around politics, but I'm also interested in the form, the, how the form engages its political space. So it's not just about where one is from, but what one is, how one is going to re-engage representation and open it up for, you know, for a world which is which is very different from what it was even 20, 30 years ago. Right. And are you thinking more about that for public art than... No, I'm thinking okay, about every, that for, for everything, everything I create. Okay. But getting opportunity for public artwork itself is a niche. You know, not every artist is invited to That's create true. public artwork. That's true. So I think without addressing that, we also can't just talk about... Uh, there are many artists who would love to do projects for public artwork, but they don't get invited. Right, right. So you have a bit more weight on your shoulders because you have, you have that invitation and or there's a responsibility. How, so like, you, right. I think that, that opening up the space in the art world is one thing. Opening up space for representation is all interlinked. And I think the, uh, the more we open up that discourse and allow different viewpoints to be visible in a more prominent manner, it just allows other artists to really project that there's possibility for their work too. Right, right. Hank? Well, yeah, and I think about that in the context of the early work that you were showing us, that um, how old is the oldest work that you're inspired by? Oh, uh, the miniature historical. Drawings. Yeah, how old oh, are yeah. they? Someone like 12th century. <laughs> right, so they're a thousand years old. And in a way, they were paving the way for you to pave the way to create opportunities, not only for you, like having the work here, having the work in public, but other, for other people to be given opportunities too. And so when I think about activism within my work, you know, I think about my mother, I think about my daughters, I think about um, all of the people who they have and will inspire, uh, and all the people who've inspired me. And I recognize that activism is not there's no boundary around it. You know, as I, I started saying before, the, every act, even breathing, because we forget, we think that breathing is unconscious, but I know people who chose to stop breathing. Um, so everyone who's here is making conscious choice to be alive and to breathe like her. But also <laughs> through that, 
we are actually <laughs> being activists. We're making a statement. Um, and I think it's important that we're conscious activists, not that we're uh, unconscious, because I think our unconscious actions, I can say for myself, have created incredible um, obstacles for me and for others. And so, at best, as artists, we're conscious activists, that we recognize that we're time travelers, that we're in interacting with people from a thousand years ago and a thousand years from now, and that that, and everybody in between, and that that is a huge, uh, not only responsibility, it's a huge opportunity. It's a, it's a gift and it's a blessing. I think that we're shamans, uh, time travelers, psychics, immortal um, uh, um, teachers, students. And, and, and I think that's what um, allows, I think, us to have the impact that we have. The fact that this art fair that's 100 years old um, and most famous in part because of an artist who made something that made no sense. Right. Uh, um, and that opened the door for, for us in many ways. It's really, it, it says a lot about what can happen in an artist studio that seems insignificant or in their mind. And the last question for you. Um, Shazia, you were awarded, awarded a Medal of Arts from the State Department in 2012. And Hank, you're being awarded this Medal of Arts later this month. Congratulations to both of them. Thank you. I think after this discussion, we understand why. Um, what does this medal mean to both of you? And what do you think artists can do as interlocutors in the civic or government space? Can they make a difference? I think you've addressed this a little bit, but what does the medal mean to you? Oh, well, I was thinking, because I'm going to come and attend your uh, ceremony, that I will get a chance to wear that medal. <laughs> it's been <laughs> sitting in a box since then. Um, of course, I think um, it's wonderful for art to get recognized, for artists to get recognized, so there's support that there. But, you know, I, I also play with a lot of humor in my art, so I'm really thinking also in terms of how art sometimes gets placed in this space of soft diplomacy. <laughs> so I cannot not just mention that, that what it means for the State Department to be you know, supporting the arts or recognizing the arts and what is the logic there. So um, I've, I have been around for so many years in my career and often seen how sometimes artists get hijacked to address these issues about representing a culture or a country or a community. And, you know, and, and, and yes, it opens up conversation, but I think we need more support from the NEA, we need more support for the arts. Definitely. Like, it has to be countered by like more financial support in schools, and just art becomes a normal thing. Like, all of us are creative individuals. So I feel like, you know, award is one thing, but there has to be action. something that comes <laughs> from that. Yeah, yeah. And Hank? Uh, I just think it's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm like, they're going to let me in the White House? <laughs> um, and, I, I, and my daughter really wants to say something other than blowing, but let me say my part first, please. Um, if I can remember it. Uh, that this country, our First Amendment, is freedom of speech. Um, and we talk a lot about that. Uh, but we don't even have a ministry of culture. We don't have a place where even what we, uh, what we profess uh, as our core value is something that's really nurtured and cared for and, and promoted um, in a way that really gives, uh, holds it at a, at, at a level of stature. And I think awards like this, which are not that old, um, are kind of the beginning of, of, of the, the United States government acknowledging that artists are civic leaders, that they're, we're civic um, operators because what we do, what we make, actually does in drive society. There is no culture without art and there's no society without culture. Yeah. Um, and so I'm really happy to be part of that legacy. Uh, Zenzi really wants to say something. <laughs> well, okay, now of course I give her the mic. Now right, right, of course. 
Typical, typical child. Mm -hmm. um, well, you can have the mic later, but right now I just want to thank Shazia and Hank. Um, thank you. On, thank on you. behalf of Ava and the Armory Show, we are so honored to have your works in the platform section. And, and, and as I said before, we need more people like you out there making a difference. So thank you so much for your... Janine, do you, do you... We're not doing questions, but did you want to say something? Yes. Oh, yeah. So Midnight Moment, which is at Times Square at 11.57 every night this month. Thank you for reminding me. Shazia has a fabulous project. Um, in, it's, it's in conjunction with uh, Times Square Arts. And did you want to say anything about that briefly? And then we'll wrap up. Uh, of course. Um, it would be amazing if you guys go check it out. It's every, mid every night at 11.57 for a few minutes of a 90 billboard. Yes, awesome. very excited. It's quite, if you haven't ever experienced Midnight Moment, it's quite a thing. It's very powerful. So congratulations on that. Thank you, Thank you both so much. And I hope you enjoy the fair. Thanks for coming. Thank you.